So then, during the Great Depression, um, during under the Franklin Roosevelt administration, we then had the establishment of the Civilian Conservation Corps. And this was an important group because, um, for a multitude of factors, the biggest one being that the, it was... Um, it put people to work and it helped curb unemployment during the Great Depression. But the second part of it is we got a lot of natural resources infrastructure um, completed through the work done by the CCC. Uh, lots of forestry work, including reforestation, fire control, erosion control, flood control, trail construction, road construction. And this was done in... Um, state, county, um, private lands, and federal lands as well. And so they worked um, for the Forest Service, they worked for the Park Service, they worked um, in uh, both in other branches of the interior and agriculture, and they did forest firefighting, they planted trees, did road clearing, um, they took care of grazing lands. It's a whole multitude of um, jobs that they that they um, were a part of. So uh, during during the time that it was around, they performed over 300 types of work projects. So let's just kind of go over the 10 general classifications. So structural improvements, things like bridges and fire lookout towers, transportation, so roads and foot trails, erosion controls, check dams, terracing, uh, flood control, irrigation, drainage, ditching, forest, uh, civil culture. So uh, civil culture, we said, the art and science of managing the forest. So planting trees and shrubs, doing timber stand improvement, uh, collecting seed, forest protection, so fire prevention, um, firefighting, insect and disease control, landscaping and recreation, so um, campgrounds and picnic ground development, lake and pond clearing, um, range management, so um, stock driveways, uh, elimination of um, predators, wildlife, stream improvements, fish stocking, and then any other um, stuff under the miscellaneous tab. So emergency work, surveys, those sorts of things. So the CCC, um, not only was it around and gave people jobs and work during a time when, when jobs were scarce, but it um, helped create a lot of the, the infrastructure that we see. So when you're on trails um, at national parks or you're, um, or you're driving down a road down a national forest, there's a very good chance that a lot of the work done to make that happen was um, performed by the CCC during this time. So now um, as we get into the, the late 1900s, we start to get into this period um, this legislative environmental law period where we really start um, trying to protect the environment here in the United States. So that starts with the Multiple Use Sustained Yield Act of 1960. And um, got a quote here, quotation here. It says, It is the policy of the Congress that na the national forests are established and shall be administered for outdoor recreation, range, timber, watershed, wildlife, and fish purposes. And then I've got a link here to, um, to um, give you more information about multiple use. But really the idea of multiple use is that even though these are national forests, we have always defined the forest as the trees and everything below them. So when we're managing the forest, we have to manage the trees and everything else. And that's what um, multiple use is talking about, the idea of managing for timber but also managing for range which is um, grasslands grazing lands managing for watershed managing the wildlife managing outdoor recreation managing mining managing any sort of um, any sort of use we can get off of these lands and the other part of um, of this legislation is the sustained yield part and it goes back um, to Gifford Pinchot and the idea of the greatest good for the greatest number in the in the long run or the greatest good for the greatest number for the longest period of time. The idea that um, we want to pull, um, we want to use the resources off of the land, but we only want to do it in a sustainable way. We only want to do it 
if it's going to uh, last for a long time. So it, it's important to really understand that idea of sustained yield. So in this act, it defines sustained yield as achievement and maintenance in perpetuity of a high level annual or re regular periodic output of various renewable resources of the national forest without impairment of productivity of the land. So basically you want to be able to um, pull a high level of um, of use off of the land but without impairing without hurting the productivity that that land has and so this act um, defined the idea that there's multiple uses for these areas and not only are there multiple uses and that um, and that management should be done for these multiple uses but then also the idea of sustained yield and that we do want to take what we can from the land, but we want to take what we can from the land without impairing the productivity of that land. In 1963, and um, again amended in 77, and then again amended in 1990, we have the Clean Air Act. So the Clean Air Act um, was the prevention and abatement of air pollution. So. Um, the Clean Air Act is important just in the idea of uh, environmental legislation really aimed at protecting um, people and um, starting to really um, clamp down on industry and making sure that industry isn't um, polluting too much and, the, and that it's, it's a way to be able to figure out how to, how to curb pollution uh, in in this country and especially making sure that the air we breathe is clean enough and um, not causing any problems and a big a big part of being able to um, to put through um, laws like this one the Clean Air Act the Clean Water Act um, the uh, the NEPA um, law that we're gonna we're gonna talk about is the Environmental Protection Agency. So the establishment of the Environmental Protection Agency and um, giving that agency the authority to then oversee um, how how industry and how um, the federal government is uh, is using natural resources and um, what's happening to the environment and being able to put standards to it and being able to um, hold people accountable that's where the Environmental Protection Agency has come in and, and been important. In 1964, under uh, President Johnson, we get the Wilderness Act. And this is um, the idea, because we have uh, we spoke about it uh, in the previous uh, lecture, about the idea of a national wilderness system. So this is when we got the creation of the national wilderness system. Now, during this act in 1964, it created 9 million acres of wilderness areas within the um, previously designated um, either national forests or uh, national parks or national monuments. But now there's about 111 acres, 111 million acres of wilderness areas um, from coast to coast in the United States. And there's a linked video down here at the bottom um, celebrating the 50th anniversary of um, the Wilderness Act. So NEPA, you heard me mention that before, that stands for the National Environmental Policy Act and that came about in 1969 where it requires federal agencies to use an interdisciplinary approach where you're looking at the natural, the you're looking at the impact on the human environment by taking in research from natural and social science sciences now the big um the big part with nepa is that um you anything that the federal government does anything that these federal agencies do needs an environmental assessment and an environmental impact statement um, to go with it um, sometimes you just need if your assessment says that that it's not going to be negatively affecting the environment then you won't need the environmental impact statement but if your environmental assessment comes through and says that you will have some sort of a negative effect on the environment, then you'll have to create an environmental impact statement which says um, how you are um, affecting the environment and what steps you're taking to uh, curb that. And so you can see in our um, 
in our uh, graphic here on the on the right hand side it talks about proposal development then you get your proposed action then there's the environmental analysis that's where this environmental assessment uh, would happen and then uh, environmental impact statement if necessary then you get a decision and you monitor evaluate and then you you could go through the whole process again if necessary but the big thing about it was that this was this uh, act required people to finally look and think about the environment and their effects on the environment and this uh, once again just like the Clean Air Act this is where the um, Environmental Protection Agency comes comes to play because they are the ones who are enforcing anything that um, that would be um, in violation of NEPA, the National Environmental Policy Act. The Endangered Species Act, 1973. Uh, the big thing about the Endangered Species Act is it doesn't actually protect any species, which I think that see, um, maybe you're sitting there going, what? Um, the big thing about the Endangered Species Act is it actually conserves the ecosystem or habitat upon which endangered or threatened plant or animal species depend. And that's a, that's a huge um, difference uh, because it's, it's really important in my mind because it really speaks to the idea of the forest being the trees and everything below them. The idea that, um, that these species, we know that they're endangered, we know that they have some sort of problem um, that's making it hard for them to survive, and the best way we can protect them is by protecting their habitat, protecting where they live. And so for a lot of species, that, that comes down to forests or grasslands, so forests or range, and the, the Endangered Species Act is all about making sure that, that habitat, those ecosystems, are functioning properly and their habitat is in the best condition possible. So I have a link down here for the northern long-eared bat and uh, it's a species of concern that's um, possibly going to get listed as an endangered species. And what's interesting about that is the northern long-eared bat's um, habitat is basically all of the, the forested areas of uh, the United States and Canada, which makes a which would really uh, impact the timber industry. So, so that's that's where it gets really interesting in terms of trying to help um, help species out and and help our environment out, but also um, how is it going to work in terms of our our need for uh, resources. In 1972, we've got the Clean Water Act, also managed by the uh, managed monitor by the Environmental Protection Agency. Um, but its main goal was to restore and maintain the chemical, physical, and biological integrity of the nation's water, and specifically targeting uh, point source and non-point source pollution. Point source being they know exactly where the problem is coming from, non-point source pollution. They, uh, they don't know, they know that there's pollution, but they don't know exactly where it's coming from. So you could have, say, uh, there's a factory right here next to this river, and there's a pipe, and there's green sludge coming out of the pipe. That would be point source pollution. We know exactly where the pollution is coming from. But if it's something like um, the mouth of the uh, Mississippi River down in New Orleans, where the water, um, by the time you see it there, is brown, and looks just has this muddy gross color to it who knows how many different places because that's the end of the mississippi river watershed who knows how many places and um, where all those pollutants are coming from we know there's pollution there so, but that would be non-point source pollution we can't say exactly where the pollution is coming from but we know that there's pollution there so it's those that clean water act was designed to try and control and um, curb uh, pollution, whether point source or non-point source. Now, what's also interesting about the Clean Water Act is that it's only for surface water. So groundwater was not 
in the Clean Water Act. And that becomes important uh, nowadays because actually California is considering now some new laws um, that they want to bring into place where they actually start monitoring groundwater and people have to um, really start looking at how much groundwater they're using and what they're putting into the um, what they're putting into the ground and where their water's coming from and um, really finally taking a look at at trying to put some laws to groundwater because uh, the Clean Water Act just deals with surface waters, water above the surface. So coming to the end here, we've got the Federal Land Policy and Management Act. Uh, this is in 1976. It allows uh, the Bureau of Land Management um, which is managing the majority of the rangelands and man managing um, about an eighth of the United States. So they are finally using um, this multiple use sustained yield model, which um, eventually leads the way to um, ecosystem management, which is these um, terms you'll start to hear nowadays. So the multiple use mandate through um, this act states that the resources and uses on public lands must be utilized in a balanced combination that will best meet the needs of the people, current and future generations. So using all the resources available on these grazing and range lands, um, and but being able to, to look at all the different multiple uses and manage it, manage it that way. Now, if you say, well, Tim, in 1960, didn't we have the Multiple Use Sustained Yield Act that said that? Yes, but it wasn't specific to say that Bureau of Land Management had to manage all of their lands that way. It just said that there are all these different um, all these different uses. And so, kind of a for instance, if one area was really heavy on sheep grazing or cattle grazing, they could manage, uh, focus on that, but as long as there was another area where they were then managing for mining, or there was another area that they were managing for recreation. And so they were, could say that they're managing for multiple use. But this, um, this act really says, no, you have to do this on every single piece of land you have to manage, uh, with multiple use. And you have to look at all of these different uses for every single piece of land. And so that's, that's the difference between the earlier act and this one. And so the Bureau of Land Management uh, took that to heart, and they even had it on um, these little um, badge cards or ID cards that they give to people, where you see on the back here, it says, Our guiding principles to improve the health and productivity of the land to support the BLM multiple-use mission. So they, they, are, they understand what they need to do, and how how to do it and they want to make sure that that the people working for them get that same uh, idea and get that same vision so they've made it to where their employees get this get this badge and have that kind of reminder with them at all times the national forest management act also of 1976 then is that we talked about it a while ago, but the re replacement to the Forest Reserve Organic Act, where um, where that's what the Forest Service had um, run its management um, based on that act. So it wasn't until 1976 now where they um, get basically the same idea that the that the BLM got with um, with the last act and got the idea that we have multiple use and we're using it on these different places, but now you have to do all of the forest land in the national forest system has to be managed with this multiple use sustained yield management. So all of the forest land must have that appropriate cheek forest cover degrees of stocking rate, rate of growth and stand conditions, conditions designed to secure the maximum benefits of multiple use sustained yield. So um, it also requires resource management plans uh, in cooperation with other agencies that have to be compliant with NEPA. So it's got to have those environmental assessments. So a lot of um, the decline in logging and a lot of the non-use um, of these lands that were set up as forest reserves, these lands that were set up as a commodity 
um, where we we're supposed to be um, taking and using um, the uh, the natural resources on these lands. They're not getting used the way that they used to and not providing um, as much output as they can because of trying to comply with NEPA and also being managed for, for multiple use. And so it's really interesting um, because the idea that they're being managed for multiple use for recreation, for wildlife habitat, for mining and timber should mean that these um, places, these natural resources that we have are being used for maximum effect and being used um, in a whole variety of different ways. But instead, uh, it's actually decreased um, our use in some ways and increased our use of these areas in some other ways. And so it's really uh, interesting to, to kind of juxtapose the idea of do, have we um, have we over legislated ourselves versus are we just not um, doing what the law was enacted to um, to do and so it's it's really an interesting idea to try and figure out how to um, how to proceed from here so these are kind of the major acts um, that have happened there's there's a lot more. Um, I just tried to pick um, a few that uh, that your book focuses on, but there there's a lot more to it than than this. But um, this gives you, I mean, I'm hoping it gives you a pretty good, just quick overview of kind of U.S. forest history and policy, just to give you an idea of um, of what we've got in terms of um, what's happened so far in this country and now where we're kind of headed from here so um, hope you enjoyed that and um, let me know if you have any questions